Welcome to Belfast Wheel. Um, today's guest is Diana Richardson. Uh, Diana is one of today's leading authorities on human sexuality. She has written seven books on how an individual can experience a more fulfilling love and sex life. Born in South Africa in 1954, she first qualified as a lawyer and then trained as a massage therapist. Her interest in the body and healing pumped an intense personal interest in the union of sex and meditation, the essence of Tantra. Since 1983, with her partner Michael, Diana has been running the Making Love workshops in Switzerland, which is attended by couples from various parts of the world. Uh, Pool Sex is Diana's eighth book, aimed at young adults. Uh, she has collaborated with uh, Wendy Dol Dolman, um, who has a he was a former attendant at one of Diana's workshops and is now a sex educator in the Netherlands. So, Diana, thanks very much for, for coming on today. Well, thank um, you. Hi, Jonathan. It's really um, lovely to talk to you. It's, it's such an interesting subject and I'm honoured to be invited. Thank you. No, thank you. Definitely. Um, just to get us started, obviously give kind of people a bit of an idea of, of yourself. Um, you originally trained as a lawyer. Um, how did you get involved in, in sex education? Um, it was through personal experimentation. You know, I studied law. I grew up in apartheid South Africa, so I really wanted to do something that maybe I could bring skills in to help uh, prejudiced people. Um, anyway, I did that, but when I got actually into the courts and so on, I realized this is not for me and actually I can do very little. Then I became a massage therapist. Um, and I just was so happy to be working with people's bodies and it just made me feel well. And that kind of interest in the body led me to start to explore sex on a personal basis. Yeah. So I had no, I, I was like 31 or something. Now I'm 67. So I had no idea that the these little steps that I made you know, in my early 30s, would actually impact the rest of my life in the sense of I then started to teach people, I then started to um, write books and so on. But there was never any goal, you know, it was more like when you start to change the elements um, of sex, then things change and you see things differently. So it was all very organic. Yeah. Rather yeah. than, you know, having a goal that I want to be this or do that. No? It just naturally grew from, from one step to the next step. Right. At, at that stage, um, and like if you look at the his, uh, our, our own history, like 2000 years ago, it was, uh, sex was, was out in the open. Um, I see an ancient Rome. It was on walls. People talked like it was, it, it was, it was a talk discussed in the weather. And obviously then, I see an, United Kingdom of Victorian times it became very much a taboo subject. It was something that didn't talk about, kept that in behind uh, closed doors. When, when you were making that transition in, in, into this, did you find there was very little um, in the way of information on sex other than what people kind of figure out themselves? Um, yes, absolutely. I mean, it is a truth that it's um, not spoken about. Um, since generations um, and like you say you know in our origins we're much more open um, but you know I grew up in a community and so it was of people actually I was living in India and um, so I was a, you know able to talk to people um, or you know just in this organic process but definitely um, you know we are missing in our education yeah. something about sex and you know nobody's to blame because what do you as a parent say to your child uh, except the usual ideas we have about sex and so that's why really for adults it's so important but particularly for for younger people who are still relatively young in terms of their sexual life ahead of them and um, so important to start to install different ideas or yes. alternatives um because the, the situation is is that you know through growing up in the society everything we get very impacted you know by what we see especially yeah. now these days with um pornography um but even before that you know there was pornography magazines there was 
all kinds of things. And when you see these things, it impacts you and then makes it has an impact on how things flow. Like, for example, me, myself, I never saw sex before I had sex. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. You know, so this is actually relatively unusual, but we're, there's other people of my age who have the same situation, but very soon that's going to be over. These people are all going to be gone and everybody who has sex sees sex first. So this makes quite an impact on people. And then, you know, the message is that's how we have to do it or need to do it, or that's how it goes. Yeah. Um, so this is the idea of adult education and why I've written seven previous books and why, you know, this time I wrote one with Wendy Dolleman, more specifically, you know, for a younger audience. Although the other books can absolutely be read by younger people too, but it was like a synopsis of what I'm teaching yeah. uh, in my couples workshops and have written in, you know, previous books. Um, what, 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 uh, what difference, what was it that you felt you needed obviously to, to obviously end the book at, at uh, a younger audience? Was it just something that you seen that it was a, there was like maybe a gap off, there was a, a gap there in, in knowledge or information for, for, for younger people? Well, there is, there is a gap. The education is actually coming through uh, pornography and movies, you know, yeah. all we see in, in films is a certain style, okay, not as extreme as in pornography. So, and actually, if you look around, there's nothing really written for young adults. Yeah. Um, and the thing why it's so great, the, the, like I started when I was 31, which is relatively young. Um, most of the people that I'm who come to my couple seminars, they, you know, well in their 40s, 50s, 60s. But when you catch a person or introduce a person to another way of thinking when they're young, um, they take to it much more easily than adults who are more like um, identified and yeah, identified and solid, solidly in this is who I am. Yeah. So, because in my seminars, you know, I've been teaching over 25 years, but I have had, um, you know, couples as young as 2021, 20, and they get it much more, more quickly because the psyche, even though it's imprinted with different uh, vi visuals yeah. and so on, still young ones are more fluid. Yeah, yeah. And, and they are more open, whereas, you know, if you yeah. get this information when you're 50, you're not so likely, well, you know, it's more of a challenge to go, okay, let me let me explore with um, something yeah. new, you know? Because I think um, when I was growing up, uh, I was uh, mentioning this before, and, and, and uh, another episode will come up along with the your one, um, and I mentioned, like, I was brought up very religious, and we got a book, uh, it was aimed at teenagers and the issue on, on sex it was very vague i mean it was it was it was more or less kind of like don't don't go there and come and consult the the elder of your church kind of it, it was just it was very it was just like what well, I, I don't get that what, what what's what it kind of laid down kind of like it was like forbidden territory that that, that was like no 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 you, you come and speak to us first and in school i was a member um the the teacher kind of who obviously unfortunately for her drew the short straw to, to teach us um, the class was separate so girls were taken out of the room and they were taken into a separate room and the teacher kind of just went quite red face clicked on a uh, part you know PowerPoint was a projector um, kind of quickly went through a few uh, slides and then put the TV on and put this video on and sat in the desk and kind of her, her head down the books and, um, and then she goes because uh, obviously she had to any, any questions just kind of nobody really asked anything and that was it TV got wheeled out of the room and the girls came back in and, and we just got on with it and that was it it was just so there, there, there's I think there's definitely a big a big gap there um, and, and, and I think it's it's uh, it, as you say it's, it's almost like a kind of a, a cultural hangover 
that still prevails today that it's yeah. it's a taboo subject it's a subject that kind of makes people uncomfortable and uh, look for the tessie teachers look for the nearest exit with in in your workshops um what what would be some of the biggest barriers that you've you've had to help people overcome you know the main thing with people is one has to change their minds okay. because at the moment, because we imprinted by sex in this um, really sensational way, you know, like the book is actually called Cool Sex because our imprinting and our idea, our idea is the hotter the better. So it's very much to do with sensation, <clears throat> excuse me, building up intensity, coming to a big explosion. Um, so actually what's happening in reality is our mind is forcing our body. It's not the choice of our body. So it's more to change people's minds and just say, look, that is one possibility, but there is another possibility, which is reducing the sexual temperature, you know, cooling right down and then actually tuning more into the body because the body, it knows how to make love. You know, the body has a natural intelligence if the mind is out the way. You know, so the thing is, we are a little bit split, you know, mind and body. So we're always like this. But if you're just more natural and more connected with the body, um, you know, your body will move and, and you just follow it. Um, so the biggest thing is to change people's minds, yeah. you know. And yeah. so... But we do that, you know, in, in a good way and slowly, slowly over, we have seven days together and make little changes. Now, of course, it takes quite a while for that to really get installed. <laughs> but um, the most important thing about a cooler approach, and actually when we're talking about a cooler approach, we also, we're talking about a more conscious approach. Yeah. To okay. be more to be more aware, to be more present. Because actually, if we look at what we call regular sex or mainstream sex or conventional sex, um, people are very mechanical, very much in routines, on automatic. And um, there's not much presence or awareness because we believe that we have to have this peak experience. So people are a little bit focused there they're not really here, no? Yeah. So yeah. it's a big shift, um, but such a valuable one because one of the big differences, and this is what is so important, is that when we have these um, hot experiences and, you know, explosion or like a discharge of energy, afterwards there's like a, a collapse. Yeah. You know, there's a feeling of disconnection, and there's a feeling of separation. <clears throat> we know the jokes about men turning over and, and, and sleeping. <laughs> so there's a loss of energy. Women also, if they observe, they, you know, if they manage to, to have an orgasm, which is sometimes not possible because of premature yeah. ejaculation. Um, if I may just say that the problem with premature ejaculation is usually because the sexual temperature is too high. Okay. You know, so that's why also with cooling down, you can extend the lovemaking. If you want to have a peak orgasm, you know, you can do it after some time, but not going in there and going for it. Yeah. Um, so the thing is, is that when, you know, th that this hot start after the discharge or the release, it creates separation. Yeah. And, um, but when you go the more cool style, actually it increases the love connection and the bonding. Okay. And, you know, this is ancient understandings because, um, you know, what I am sharing with people and what I experimented myself is from the field of Tantra. And um, they've known this for a long time. Okay. Yeah. But, but only recently it's been proved, you know, with hormone studies that actually everyone talks about these hormones, dopamine, 
you know, this is like this quick high that you get and a hormone called dopamine is released. But after that, a hormone called prolactin is released and that causes the disconnection and the separation. Whereas when you go for a cooler style and you extend the lovemaking, afterwards is a feeling of, of connection, of bonding, of well-being, because a hormone called oxytocin is released. So I don't talk too much about hormones, but I think it, now that information is out, it's, um, it's important to realize. But really, I learned myself through just observing when I do this, this is how I feel afterwards. When I do that, that's how I feel afterwards. And so in that way, was able to differentiate, you know, and um, yeah. explore. If, if, I could, if I could ask um, if a few questions on, on what you were talking about there. Uh, when you have couples that come into the workshop, um, what, if, if any, what would be some of the common um, scripts, that societal scripts that the guys would carry and what would be common the common uh, societal scripts that the women would carry? Uh, is, is there any? Do, do you find that people kind of carry in like a preconception that kind of society's one, like you're a guy, this is how it goes for you, you're a girl, this is how it goes for you? Um, well, I would say the main scripts, because there are many subscripts, the main script is that in the conventional sense, men carry tremendous amount of performance pressure. And this is often unknowingly because we have mis misunderstandings or misconceptions about sex. It puts a huge pressure on a man in the sense of um, he needs to get an erection. He needs to maintain the erection. If possible, his woman has to orgasm before he does. In our fantasies, it's always like, oh, if we come together, that's great. Um, the situation with women is that we are very much programmed to pleasing a man. Okay, yeah. And, you know, so for a woman, love is the most important thing for her. So she will do anything and often compromise her own truth to keep the man happy, to keep love in her life. Because the last thing she wants is a man to leave her because she's um, not sexually, uh, for you know, uh, yeah, you know what I, I mean. Yeah. No. Um, so these, this is really one thing. So is the performance pressure and the pleasing. And it ends up that often women are doing sex as a duty. Okay, yeah. No. And so that is a big problem because, um, you know, when it's a duty, you're always stepping over your truth. Actually, you don't want to do it. Or the main thing with women, for instance, is that they their bodies need longer to warm up and open up for sex. And it's not a psychological thing. It's just our energies are different. Male is much more like uh, ready quickly. Um, and one of the biggest fears of men is loss of erection. Yeah. So that's why as soon as a man has an erection, he just wants to go in there and, and, and get going to keep the erection. He's man is tremendously afraid of loss of, of erection. Um, so this is also why women, we also, you know, say yes, even that most women, of course, I'm talking in generalizations, yeah. but most women will, would like, you know, let's just kiss and cuddle for another half an hour or something, you know, until, you know, the woman really feels yeah. ready to receive somebody into her body. Um, so, so these are, you know, quite important things that impact how we, how we have sex, but it, you know, in the cool style, um, certainly You know, if, if, if there is, erection is lost, actually, and many men know this and have experienced it, that from, from love and connection, an erection can grow. Yeah. You know, even if he's relaxed, the penis is relaxed, and then after a while, da -da, it will come back. Um, and I ask always in my seminars, which men have experienced that? And every man puts, puts the hand up. Um, 
but it's to do with being present and connected. Yeah. Um, and of course, when if, if erection isn't there, doesn't return, there is really a possibility of uh, putting the relaxed penis into the vagina, um, yeah. which is a totally viable alternative. It goes against our ideas that man has yeah. to, but, um, um, but that is very viable. And also sometimes, and it's, you know, obviously it's not scripted, but sometimes from just, you know, the penis lying relaxed in the vagina and, and people, the couple connecting, then the penis can, through love and presence and connection, can also rise, you know. Yes. Uh, he kind of like uh, snakes upward into the vagina. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's quite awesome. But what is interesting, you know, since we are talking also about young people, is that quite, you know, over the many years I've been working with people, quite a few men have come to me and said when they first heard about sex and that a man enters a woman, they just vis visualized entering the woman and just relaxing. Okay. Yeah, which is beautiful. Uh, yeah. You know, then they saw like porno and so on. And they realized, oh, I've got all this action to do. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So that is interesting. Because is, now yeah. when man sees something on pornography and women too, you think, oh, hallelujah, you know, I've got to pull that whole story together. And also we do forget that when we watch porno, it's fake. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's totally fake. Yeah. You know, so we're basing our sexual reality on something that's fake. Yeah. You know, you've got to protect it. Unrealistic standard or unrealistic um, display as such. And, and and yes, because people are acting it out. They're actually not really doing it. You know, they might be doing it, but it's it's a show for the camera. <laughs> so, and, you know. And uh, just, you, you mentioned uh, Tantra, we mentioned that at the introduction. Just for anyone who's going to be watching this and they're, they're really going, what, what, what is that? What, what is Tantra? And, and if I remember rightly, uh, that was in India. Isn't that right? Yes, it is originates in India, you know, uh, many thousands of years ago. And certainly, you know, the, the whole principles developed into the sexual arena, um, maybe about 2000 years ago. And um, basically, the word Tantra is san Sanskrit and means expansion of energy. Now, if we actually look at conventional sex, mainstream sex, uh, we're compressing energy. You know, we're getting tense, we're pushing the body. And if you notice, the closer we get, the tenser we get, the tenser you get, the less you can feel. Um, so the energy is not expanding, but our body is actually designed to expand energy. Okay. And um, so it's really to make love in a style and in a way where where the energy expands and spreads through the body and and beyond the body. And um, you know, many of us have had, especially maybe not the age range. This book is written for like fourteen to twenty five, but any adult can read it. In fact, um, adults read it in my workshops and go, wow, this is such a good synopsis. Yeah. So anyway, those of us who are a bit older have probably had blissful experiences. You know, if you're just sitting in nature and you just completely relax and you're with your senses and the sounds and the fragrances, you know, you will experience this, um, you know, this expansion and feeling just like uh, held, you know, or, connected with everything that's around you and it's those experiences that are really touching anytime our energy expands we remember that yes yeah. you know you yeah. can remember that like i know the first time i had an expansive experience i was seven years old i can remember it as clear as a bell yeah whereas uh you know, obviously I've, I've had many more since then, but they, they are like highlights. Whereas yeah. you can have a thousand and one 
regular sexual experiences and it was nice yeah. but it doesn't yeah. nothing stays with you you know um whereas when the, when the energy expands yeah it, it really impacts you on a cellular level and that stays with you yeah. So, you know, Tantra is a delicate field because there's a lot of people using that word or teaching things which yeah. I would not necessarily... Yeah. It gets thrown about quite a lot. It, it's, ter it's a term like you see get, it gets thrown about quite a lot. Um, yes. Kind of yes. muddies the waters a bit. Yes, no, and that is a sadness. That really is a sadness. Um, you know, even to the... Ex Sometimes in the sexual field, definitely waters get muddied, but then people talk about tantric cooking and tantric painting and, you know, you just pull in the word tantra and <laughs> if you can. But yeah, essentially it's very pure. It means expansion of energy. So in the lovemaking context, it's, you know, how to allow the energy to expand. And a lot of it is to do with relaxation. You know, and relaxation doesn't mean just like collapsing on the floor or on your bed. It, it just means softening the body, observing where you carry tensions. Because the moment you consciously relax the body, like I can do that now. Yeah. Or so the genital area, often we're holding tight, shoulders. The moment I consciously do that, I feel lots of sweet, delicate, fine things expanding in my body. Yeah. Um, you know, breathing is important, having the eyes open so that one is really present. Um, so, um, obviously, the title of the book is called Cool Sex. Um, and I know you briefly kind of touched on, on hot sex. What, just for people watching, um, they, get, they get kind of an understanding, how would you, what would be the difference between? Cool sex and hot sex. Well, you know, as we touched on it earlier, hot sex is more sensation and intensity and building up energy focused, whereas cool sex is more about relaxing and coming back more into the body. Okay. Yes. And hot sex is more uh, mechanical. Yeah. Cool sex is more conscious. And the thing is, when we're more conscious, we actually can feel a lot more. So the subtitle of the book, I'll just show the book. Yeah. We can... yeah. Okay. Um, and there's Wendy. I, I, I co-authored with her because she has young people. I, I don't have children. I, I chose not to. Yeah. Um, but she... Um, yeah, she had three young sons, actually. Okay. So that, that was a nice kind of bridge. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the subtitle is An Essential Young Adult Guide to Loving Mindful Sex. So, you know, when we talk about mindful, we're talking about awareness, just to be more here, paying attention to what, yeah. what you're doing. And the moment we bring more awareness to anything, it changes it. Yeah. Uh, you know, it can pretty much take your time. Pretty much, um, you're not not rushing to, to get to the finish line. That's it. It's, it's it's pretty much just see, like pretty much doing it without any expectations. The movement is that nice. right? Yeah. It's, yes. No, I mean that is really a good point. That this, this we have so many expectations. Yeah. That if these expectations are not fulfilled, we think we are. All, there's something wrong with us or we have a lot of self-doubt yeah. um so certainly you know the less we can have like an agenda or, or a program um the better but you know if i say i've got this cup of tea here now i can just bring it to my mouth yeah. but if i really do it mindfully You know, it's a different experience. It's not just yeah. automatic. Yeah. So that's maybe not a good illustration, but yeah, you're, you're more present. Is that right? You're, you're more, you're more present. You're, 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 yes. you're taking your time. you more. It's like um, uh, I think this might help as an analogy. It, you see people kind of going to like the most beautiful spot, spots in the earth, um, like 
I'm going to use Mount Fuji, yeah. And they got their phone and then they walk away instead of just like sitting down, taking in, looking in, trying to soak up as much of what you're you're, you're experiencing. That that would be right. That would be, be Absolutely. now. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And honestly, with the introduction of the, you know, everyone's got these mobile phones and smartphones and so on. And you can just see it now any time a person has a gap. Yeah. When they could just be standing on the station platform, being in the body, breathing, we're doing something with the phone. So we're always disconnected from, from the reality. But this uh, this thing, what you say, yeah, people immediately want to record something or photograph something and they miss the moment. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Um, the, obviously, the book, as, as we mentioned, it, it, it's, um, it's aimed at... Uh, Young young people, um, but also is is also aimed for the cover obviously gay lesbian connections as well, and obviously there's there's some people who who identify as gender fluid. Is it also kind of aimed towards that audience as well? Um, you know, basically my experience is heterosexual. Yeah. Okay. So, of course, one can only teach what is one's experience. Yeah. So, but at the same time, I do know without doubt that many of the principles can be applied. Of course, there might be some genital details that are different, but people need to just play around and see how they can adapt to that. But things like presence, awareness, softening the body, not going for the finishing line. Um, any two people can uh, embrace those principles and they will find a big shift yeah. in the connection in, and in the love. And especially this thing that it's, it really is a reality that the more aware we are, the more loving we are. Yeah. So when you bring awareness, you're creating love. Yeah. And I've seen, you know, thousands of times over the years with couples because couples tend to come in a state of disconnection. You know, they're more parallel. Yeah. And, and the honeymoon is long forgotten. But through bringing in the awareness and the presence, boom, you can create connection again. And that's actually, um, you know, when people talk the honeymoon phase, that's when we are just so 100% there. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You know, we, we just there and then slowly, you know, life sets in or we get accustomed and then the level of, of presence goes down. And so as that happens, there's a feeling of separation, not necessarily couples separating. Yeah. But like a disconnect. The magic, the magic, no, yeah. the magic it's, is gone. In a way, if, if you uh, I have, I have a coach, uh, like Marsars coach, and he always talks about condor moment and what is it what he's meaning by that is um condor would fly quite high in, in the sky and the, the people see all over the, the big the bigger picture as such in, in a way the, this book is, is is also kind of hinting at that as well um yes it's, it's obviously focused on on uh, the sex side of the human experience but if you really look at it it's also covering um the, the lessons and the principles can be applied to to life in general time spent with like the grandparents, kids, friends, family. Um, we, we, I think we've become, and I'm not knocking modern society because it's given us a lot of benefits as well, but it, it, the one of the trade-offs is that, is that we're, we've become more disconnected. Like we just mentioned mobile phones. Um, we're more switched off than we're switched on. So, so yeah. that would be right in saying that, that, that you could take the, book and the lessons in the book expand that and that would kind of cover pretty much it would help you kind of be more present in, in life in general absolutely that's really really true um yeah like you know we we just on automatic bit mechanical absent um so absolutely it's not exclusively uh, to do with sex it is a, a way of living life more connected to the body yeah uh, not so much the mind and actually if you look at our education since generations it's all about the mind yeah 
Yeah. Nothing about the body. Of course, we do sport for one, two hours a week, and often that's competitive, so it's not so comfortable. Somebody's good, somebody's not so good. Um, but nobody really teaches us, you know, how to breathe. Yeah. How, yeah. how yeah. to eat. Most people just swallow food. They don't chew. Yeah. Uh, so how even to go to the toilet? You know, most people are just pushing not just relaxing and letting the whole thing flow, which if you have a good diet, it will. Yeah. And how to walk, how to sit, how to stand. So with the body, there's this, um, it's kind of like a blind spot. Yeah. We, we aren't giving education. And then, of, of course, you've got sex on top of that. Um, but like now these days when, you know, I see school children, they're all carrying these backpacks that are heavy and they leaning forward already getting, you know, like a hunchback, a stoop back, the neck and shoulders is way out here. So by the time these people, you know, get to thirties or something, their structure has been deformed. Yeah. You know, just through the backpack. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. I forget the, an apology. Uh, I forget the name of the Greek philosopher, but, um, that was one thing that the Greeks were, a lot of their philosophers were kind of tuned into was not just developing your mind but your body as well um, I think it was Socrates but I'm not, not can't remember uh, for sure but you, you're right I think we're we're very um, there's a very disconnected people when we get involved in the physical side but neglect the mental side and people get involved in the mental side but neglect the physical side and you've got this these kind of classical disconnects you see in, in, in set like the, the, the jocks and the nerds as the Americans would probably um, put, put, put it. Um, what, uh, just one, one of the questions we'll kind of touch on, I know we'd, I asked you about the difference between cool sex and hot sex um, and, and just to kind of go through, what, what's, what's wrong or what's, um, what's negative about hot sex? And what's wrong with it? And what what can we what can we learn from that? I know we just touched on that that it's very uh, goal oriented. There's a there's an end in sight, get over and done with. But but what what's what's some of the downsides to it? Um, I just want to before I go go that um, is to say that we're just talking about the body. That often when people are involved in the physical body, it's still quite mechanical. It's not awareness yeah. so i've seen you know you can see people who have incredible coordination and they can do all kind of things but they still lack awareness yeah so it's 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 you know about moving the body with uh, with awareness and then that is really really the key so look you know there's nothing wrong with hot sex mm -hmm. it's just that there are alternatives. Of course, you know, with a lot of hot sex, you get these hormonal outcomes that uh, we talked about. And the way I really like to talk about is not so much hormones, but we go into disconnection. Yeah. And then it takes a while to find each other again. Um, so it's really about um, offering an alternative so that people have, ah, you know, it's just not one narrow stream. And the thing is, is like people tend to then make love in that style, the hot style for the rest of their life. Yeah. And because of sexual insecurity, we stay very much on a what we know path. It's not, we're not so flexible about exploring the unknown. Yeah, it's, I suppose it's a bit like... Um... The, the, the big talk now with, with uh, industries and, and jobs is automation. In a way, it's almost like we've uh, we're just automating our, our sex life. It's just like I, I don't want to think about this. I'm gonna give it just, just automate it basically and, and just hit hit the on button and right. like with machines it creates this process. There's your end product, job done. Yes, no, that is absolutely true, and you know the value of. Um, 
you know, cool sex is that it definitely reduces the performance pressure for men. And, you know, when men, you know, a premature ejaculation is extremely common. And that creates a lot of self-doubt yeah. in a man. He thinks there's something wrong with him, but it's not. The body is beautiful. You know, it's just the style, the way we're using it. And for women, you know, in, in a short frame of time, women often, and like we talked earlier, the body is not open. Uh, women can't come. Many women have that situation. And um, so this for women, then they think there's something wrong with them. Blo they blocked. And this also creates self-doubt. And that's not healthy. Yeah. But when we, we slow down and, and everybody has enough time, then it, it really empowers you. So sex tends to disempower us. Yeah. In the long run. Um, we might feel a couple of explosive moments we feel all powerful but it's really really more like um in the long term and the other thing you know what's so interesting is that you know if you watch movies and any couple come together people tend to be all over each other yeah you know what i mean the woman is totally on the man the man is totally on the woman but nobody is really anchored inside their whole in their own body and um so actually, when I'm in all my books, and, and the first thing I do in my workshops when I'm teaching couples is the first thing is to come back to your body. Now, because instead of being over, you know, you come more inside and then you move from, from outs, inside to outside. And this brings a totally different quality. So it's not... Um, you know, the book is really not about saying one style is wrong and the other is right, because this, again, is not healthy. Something's yeah. wrong, something's right. It's just to say that there are alternatives, and the more we can increase the awareness, the mindfulness, and be present, it becomes something completely different. Yeah. That, that creates love, bonding, connection, and supports a couple you know, yeah. in their life. Um, anyone, and obviously um, the book, book's available, Cool Sex is, is available now um, to, to, to purchase. Um, anyone watching this or, or what what advice, how, how can how could somebody, uh, is there an exercise or something they could try to implement Cool Sex into the relationship now that, that you could give if that's possible? Um. You know, in the book itself, there's a lot of, of exercises given. Um, you know, with breathing with and, and also energizing the pelvis, basically getting more energy into the body. But there is one thing that, you know, it's what I start with. I do workshops also for women, couples, all my books. It starts with taking your attention into your body. And actually looking around, and this is something you do when you're cooking, driving, doing your homework, whatever you're doing, you, you, you close the eyes for a moment and you, you know, you feel into your body and you look for a place that you can feel from the inside. There's no special place. It could be solar plexus, lower belly, genital area, heart. Anyway, it, it, it shouldn't be the head. You know, it, it needs to be kind of below the neck. Yeah, yeah. And to hold the awareness in that place, like now, you know, okay, I'm generally aware in my body, but right now I'm very much focusing in my solar plexus area. Now that acts like an anchor. Okay. So when okay. I, you know, it's natural that we space out and start to think, and then you just come back, re-anchor yourself, chop your vegetables, stir your food, do your homework, walk. Uh, and that practice really brings you more in the present. Okay, yeah. And yeah. that's it. And really the more present we can be in any activity and also in making love, it's transforming. Yeah. So that Just is something that... Sorry, it, it's something that could be done pretty much anywhere. It, it, you don't have to kind of, like, I'll take 15 minutes into a room here. You can do it, as you said, preparing dinner or um, yes, going yes. out for a walk or whatever. Yeah. And look, I love watching movies, you know, but I'm always like, uh, 
relaxing, relaxing my shoulders. Another place where people are very tense is in the jaw. And often, you know, we're holding here. And the minute you relax here, relax the shoulders, relax your belly, <sighs> the body takes a big breath. Yeah. You know, it's just a spontaneous thing. So these two things just keep observing tensions and how habitually the shoulders go up, the jaw gets tight, belly. Well, with the belly, we have this idea that it has all got to be flat. So we're holding it in. It's a tension. It stops expansion, you know, which is, and you relax your belly, shoulders, jaw, and body breathes. So with that and the inner anchor, and, and practicing that, you know, you just feel a lot better. Yeah, no, definitely. Because I think it, it, it surprises you when you do focus on that, how much, uh, as you say, we spend all, we spend every day, uh, obviously before all these lockdowns, we were very busy running about. Um, and it's surprising the amount of tension you carry in your body. When I mean, you take that kind of moment that you're saying to kind of step aside and, and release that, it surprises you how much how much you're actually carrying. Yes. Um, but, which is quite draining. It's, it's almost like um, um, it, 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 it's a counterproductive. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely, absolutely. And the other thing is that our minds are a little bit trained, or our systems are a little bit trained on intensity. Yeah. Okay, so we talked about sensation. People love intensity. We do bungee jumping, paragliding. You know, why these moments are great, even that they are dangerous, you, it brings you into, into the present. So we're a little bit programmed to, to notice intensity, but we're not really aware of the, the, the small, delicate, fee, good feelings in the body. Yeah. You know, our sensitivity. Yeah. So so it's like we focused on sensation, but actually we're inherently sensitive. And even when I, you know, do scan, I quote, you know, scan my body for tensions. Ah, you know, and then I can just feel, oh, all these sweet, good, very fine, delicate experiences in my body. So we also need to give that a value. Yeah. The awareness will do that, but, but you know, if you just do something mechanical, switch off, you know, but when you consciously do something, the body responds and becomes alive, but on a subtle level. And that's what we need to begin to, to value and, and acknowledge actually say, oh, yeah. wow, I can feel these sweet little bubbles or whatever, you know, expanding yeah. through the body. Yeah, so yes, yes. Um, is uh, obviously you, you've wrote uh, eight, eight books. Um, is, is the book enough to change people's experience in sexuality? And if not, what else would you would you recommend is needed? Well, look, reading the book is a really good start because it just gives gives some ideas, and you know it really depends on individuals. Because some people have read my books and it's been great. Other people prefer to come to a class and learn. Um, but anything that anyone does with the body is really a good way to go. Yeah. Um, you know, like we were talking, in your daily life, start to bring more attention. So it's not like um, that you become generally more switched on. So it does depend on the individual, but if people find that it's good to read the book to change your mind a little bit. Yeah. And then uh, depending on your situation, you might have a partner, you might not um, try things out with a partner. Uh, if you don't have a partner, just see what you can do in terms of you know, keeping the spine straight, softening, and just observing this practice of taking the attention from outside where we are basically all focused um inside yeah um and then um yeah relaxation you know softening and so on so these kind of practice practices set the stage for you know when you explore a little bit more yeah but the main thing is even if you don't read the book 
you just remember mindfulness or awareness and to do everything you know with more consciousness and being more present and yeah. then you're you're all set <laughs> no definitely because this takes them to the next question and um it, we, we've talked about pornography and, and, and especially now it's so badly available um like, like as you, years ago so we've had to order something we online or, 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 or online but we're a catalog or go to a news agent to pick a magazine up and now it's obviously we all have smartphones it's it's, it's on the internet um, what 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 would be your take on the war of technology uh, going going forward that it will have on um, or currently has on human human sexuality? Obviously, there's a lot of um, negative prospects that we've probably heard about in the news, and, and and or do you think there's any any positive to take away from it? Uh, to be honest, I I can't really I don't want to say you know. Yeah. Um, because I don't want to be judgmental or I've never really watched pornography, you know, caught some like staying in a hotel, suddenly you'll flick on the wrong channel or something. Yeah. And to me, it just always looks so funny, so ridiculous, you know, especially because I know the other side. Um, I think pornography is not healthy. Yeah. Because it's actually yeah. changing our brains and so on. And, um, but what yeah. to say? Yeah, no, because um, I, I think uh, again, not not to sound judgment, I think there's there's a there's a risk that we're we could go down a line a route where that as I said, we all we already talked about the, the disconnect. Um, I think there's a danger that. Um, technology becomes more and more pervasive in their life. Again, I'm not anti-technology, there's a lot of benefits from it. But I think in this area, um, I, I agree with yourself, I think it would create more of a disconnect and long-term cause more harm um, in that human-to-human -human connection. Um, it, it, it almost becomes like a, like a third wheel, um, it, it, my kind of take on it. Yes, no, you're right. And, and, you know, especially because you know, often the person watching, I mean, they can watch in a couple and, and that can get excitement. No? But often it's one person watching and then there's a lot of self-sex, you know, self-masturbation and so on. And so everybody's having these single experiences, you know, so you have a experience with a screen yeah, rather yeah. Than, than a human experience. So, yeah. As you say, you know, definitely more disconnect. Yeah. Um. What obviously we uh before before we start, you, you mentioned I think you've you've got a workshop coming up this week. Um. What what's what's the plans for the coming year? Um. Do, do you have any other? You're working on any other projects, books, etc. Well, you know, I do this year twelve workshops. I mean, four have been cancelled. From next year onwards, we're going to do less. Um, workshops for for different reasons uh, actually we we need to find a new venue and so on because the current venue has closed down will be closing down okay. because of covid and as far as books go you know i still do have some ideas um but i don't think i'll do it well, okay right. yeah I, I don't think i'll do it um it just is too much time at the computer. Yes, okay. Way too much. And I've, you know, I've basically said everything that I want to say. There's a few things that I would like to focus on because, you know, my different books, essentially the sexual material is the, is the same. So it's not like each book is, <clears throat> excuse me, each book is saying something different. That wouldn't make sense. It's just I've written a book for women from the female angle, written a book for men with my partner from the male angle. Now I've from, uh, run one on menopause, uh, young adults. Um, yeah, so I've spent many, many hours at the computer and I think I might be cooked. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, it's, it's, you know, shoulders get tired, necks get 
get tired, the body gets older. So if it was an easy process, then I would. But actually, it's it takes a lot of discipline and getting it right. And then once you've got the book submitted to a publisher, uh, then there's a whole other process, you know. So it's I think it's I'm cooked. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. who knows? <laughs> yeah. if, if I can ask just 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 uh, on that topic, when, when you're writing the book, um, t- typically how long would would that process take to write the book, and and how many kind of um, copies would you go through, like like from your initial first draft? I can't really say, but it's hundreds of hours, you know. Okay. It's yeah. hundreds of hours. And, um, you know, so one, I, I tend to to just write, you know, okay. just it comes, it comes very easily to me because I'm talking about something, the body is something very close to me. But then one has to go through, look for repetitions, trance, oh, that should belong in this chapter. This should go, you know. So there's hundreds of hours you know some people might be able to do a book in three days but um and i had a friend who did that once in mexico um but it's it's really hundreds and and then you know sometimes it's quite tough to sit down at the computer yeah Yeah. and then sometimes then you you work for three days until you go i cannot look at the script again and then you get the slight allergy, you know, <laughs> to, to being at the computer. But then you might wake up three days later and just like be longing to get back to the script. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So it's definitely, you know, you need to take breaks. And uh, when you feel cooked, stop, regenerate, come back. So I, I, I must say that I've always been surprised how, how that works. You know, you get kind yeah. of plugged in and... Yeah, so I'm I'm happy with what I've done. I don't think I need to to do more unless it just happens um, organically. I mean, I've got three different outlines waiting. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. Um, no, uh, this just we're near the end of, of of our time here. So, um, one of the questions I've, I've started I've asked a few people this: um, what would be your mission statement? Um, if you could summarize that up. Uh... Um, be more loving. Yeah. Be more loving, be more kind, be more generous. Yeah. And, uh, you know, obviously the more awareness you have in the body, you know, this affects your capacity to love and your lovingness. Um, yeah. Be more Excellent. loving, be more kind, be more aware. Yeah, no, yeah. definitely. Um, then, uh, how, how can people get in touch with you? Um, and how can they book on to some of the workshops or uh, purchase your books? Uh, right, a lot of the books are available on Amazon. Some people don't like Amazon these days, which is totally understandable. Yeah. Um, but uh, I have a website, uh, www.livinglove.com, livinglove.com. And there you can see all my books and different alternatives where you can order them from. Uh, okay. um, and workshops are there and so on. As well. Okay, now I'll put a link to that website on the show notes below. So also, I'm on watch okay. so you can just scroll down below and the link will be, will be there. Uh, right. Dan, thank you so much for, for your time. Um, I, Really appreciate you, you, you coming on, and uh, it, I says I think it's a, it's a good subject to to talk about and kind of bring from outside the call and bring it in, and, and, and it, it, it's I think it's uh, the work that you're doing is really important. I think it it helps kind of bring bring that back, bring sex back to the to the to the basic human connection as opposed to the kind of scripts that we kind of get we, we kind of adopt as we grow up. So, so thank you very much. Well, Jonathan, thank you. It's really lovely. And, and really, if, if one has a more conscious approach to sex, it really does change your life. And so I very much appreciate um, your taking the time and also, you know, inviting me. And yes, 
bring um, bring sex out from behind the curtains into center stage. <laughs> yeah. No, thank thank you.